maybe if you've visited some of the other mathematical talks at this Congress, um, this talk will be much harder to understand. I mean, we are talking about the fourth dimension. We can, we, we human beings cannot can only imagine three dimensions. Therefore, there will be very, very, very few pictures and very, very, very many problems. I hope you don't have any problems with that. So the talk will be uh, given by the two of us, Matthias and myself. I'm a big fan of Matthias. Also, I'm a very good friend of Matthias. And therefore, don't be surprised when we just interrupt each other. It's a normal mathematical style of giving talks when there are many speakers. They will interrupt each other all the time. Also remember that you have a responsibility that this talk will be good. If it's a mathematical talk, mathematics is hard. Therefore, you are encouraged to ask questions at all the time. Do not save your questions till the end of the talk, but interrupt us in the middle of the sentence as hard as possible. You are on bonus <laughs> plan. <laughs> okay, so let's start with what are four dimensions. Okay, recall, in ordinary space, we, have, we can move in three dimensions. We can move left and right, we can move up and down, and we can move to the front and to the back. These are three directions. And we should just learn as three coordinate axes, of course. I mean, there's left and right, uh, up and down, and forth and back. It's X, Y, and Z. X, Y, Z. No problem, right? Okay, so what about four dimensions? In four dimensions, it's exactly the same. You have four dimensions, like up and down, left and right, front and back, and then, well, um, fourth direction, right. orthogonal to all of these. <laughs> it's yeah. a W direction. We have X, Y, Z, X, and W. Y, Z, and W, and W is not here. It's not here, it's not here, because all of these that I can show you here are not orthogonal to all the other three axes. I need another axis that is orthogonal to these three, to each of these three. Okay, and I can't show you it in three-dimensional space, because this is three-dimensional space. I don't have a fourth orthogonal axis. Okay, what do we call the movement in the fourth direction? I mean, up and down. So what's the, the change of W? Up and down, left and right, front and back. Let's call it Anna and Kata. Anna and Kata. Okay. Uh, moving to positive W directions is called moving Anna. Moving in negative W directions is called moving in direction Kata. Okay. And now you can uh, understand this picture. So start with a zero dimensional cube. <coughs> this has also an, a different name, namely it's a point. A zero dimensional cube is just a point. Okay. Now extend it in one direction, in one dimension. Then you are tying a line segment, an edge. This is called a one-dimensional cube. Extend it again in, the, in another direction, like for instance, to the downwards, and then the y directions, and then you have a square, which is also called a two-dimensional cube. Do this step again, and you obtain a three-dimensional cube. Do it just again, one more time, moving Anna a little bit. <laughs> this was not the correct <laughs> thing with the hands. And then you obtain the four-dimensional cube, which is also called the hypercube or the tesseract. <coughs> and, you see, and you see very clearly that it was just moved in direction Anna, and there you see these lines which have been traced out by you. So this is your first picture of a four-dimensional body. It's a picture of the tesseract. And actually, of course, uh, this fourth dimension here is not orthogonal to the others. But that's not really a big deal. We know this because it's also the case here. On this plane here, on the board, this line isn't orthogonal to these two at all. It's like 45 degrees or something. Yeah, these were orthogonal. This one, this one is not orthogonal. But of course, with this picture, we mean a three-dimensional object. And at a three-dimensional cube, 
if you imagine this cube that you can see here, that this vertex here, we have the three edges, and they are orthogonal to each other. And it's just seen here. This is a projection of a three-dimensional cube onto a two-dimensional wall. This is a projection of a four-dimensional cube on a two-dimensional wall. The only difference is in our biology. So evolutionarily, we evolved to immediately understand the perspective drawings like this one. So when we look at this, we don't see a 45 degrees angle here, but in our head, immediately we see a 90 degrees angle. We see a correct cube. It's, in principle, it would be the same here, but we didn't evolve that way. So this just looks like a version. One warning is very important. So one of uh, some of you have surely heard of like four-dimensional space-time or eleven-dimensional string physics. This is not at all what we mean. In this talk, we are going to talk about four-dimensional space, where the tra where traveling in the fourth the new dimension is not an unusual thing at all. It's not like moving in time or moving in quantum foam. It's just like left, right, top, down, front, back, and undercover. It doesn't have anything to do with special string theory interpretations of physics. And it doesn't have anything to do with time. Okay, I think we can, I think we can um, talk a little more about the Tesseract, the four-dimensional cube here. Uh, of course, uh, we can see the first properties of this cube if you look closely. For example, what about the number of its vertices? Okay, let's start in dimension zero again. There's one vertex. Dimension one, the line. There's two vertices, four vertices, eight vertices. What's the next number? Of course, it says 16 vertices. And you can count the big picture. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and another eight. Okay, and also we could uh, count edges. Uh, yeah, also we could count edges here. I mean, we can see all the edges, except for this one that you move from top to top. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, what else can we see? Well, what about faces? Does the tesseract have faces just like a three dimensional object? Okay, I said uh, the two dimensional cube has edges just like a square. I mean, the size of the square, we call them edges. And uh, this cube here has faces, it has six faces two-dimensional faces. Um, what about the tesseract? I can see faces here too. For example, this square one in front, and this one that ought to be square, but <coughs> projected to a polarogram. And then there are more faces. You, you uh, to pay attention that you forget, um, that you don't forget, for example, this one. This parallelogram here is one face of the tesseract too. But uh, just as uh, the cube had faces that the square didn't really have, and the square had edges that were boring when, when we had the line, because there's only one edge, of course, um, there's a new thing like faces. The tesseract also has hyperfaces, or let's call them cells to have a new word. So we have vertices, edges, faces, and then cells. Cells are three dimensional. And they are so like, just like the, the, um, the bounding faces of four-dimensional object. And where are they? When you look at the tesseract, well, here we can see one view. And this is one of the cells of the tesseract. OK, uh, here's so another one, but how so many three yeah. objects? So in 3D, uh, we have one, one cell. One cell. In 3D, yeah, we have cell. one cell, and this cell is bounded by six two-dimensional faces. Mm -hmm. right. The four-dimensional tesseract has one four-dimensional body, and it's bounded by eight three-dimensional sets. Wait, how do we do that? Eight? <laughs> yeah. I know. Okay. <laughs> Square, 
connected with this square is kind of Q2, right? Okay, uh, but I don't want to count the picture. What I wanted to do is um, count the count the face of the cube and the edges of the square and the vertices of the one dimension cube, the line. Because these are always the n minus one dimensional bounded faces. The cube is bounded by six faces. The square is bounded by four uh, edges. The line is bounded by two vertices, two, four, six. Probably it's eight in the test. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then show the more. Yeah. So there's also five dimensional space. Inside of it, we have a five dimensional hyper hyper cube. And it will consist of ten hyper cubes at its sides. Three-dimensional body, yeah. like three-dimensional cube. I can fold it out. I can cut the edges and fold it out to two-dimensional thing. Yeah, that's so how you construct a, uh, a cube in in like a school. Yeah, you, you take a paper and you take scissors and you take glue and yeah. yeah. So yeah. I could do the same with a four-dimensional cube as yeah. well. Yeah, and, and we'll do it, it in a couple of minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be not a good four-dimensional talk if we didn't tell uh, the story. I think there was a question before on that. But okay, then we go. Yeah, uh, if we have, um, like if a three dimensional cube consists of six two dimensional cubes, um, <coughs> how many cubes do fit in a four dimensional body? That's right. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we, uh, what we just said. Um, we, have, we have six faces here and four edges there. These are obviously bounding, which can say the object is made of, and here you have eight cubes that are the boundary of the chest of the four Thanks. And then there was a question there, yeah? Is there a two-dimensional projection for every other mathematical yeah. dimension? So yeah. I can also easily project 16-dimensional You can do it, bodies. and uh, it will look like this, only with much more lines drawn it, and we will not represent it. <laughs> <laughs> And there's one thing which is a little bit better, because uh, you can, so this was a projection of a tesseract to a two-dimensional board. But if we were artists, we could make a three-dimensional project projection of the tesseract, namely like a three-dimensional sculpture of a tesseract. Okay, and then it would be one dimension less uh, of uh, losing information, so therefore it would look a little bit nicer for our eyes, but not very much so. Can we think of it for the four dimensional cube? Like we have, um, what I think about the cube is that they take two, two, two D cubes yeah. cubes first, and I, I connect the dots. Yeah. So I make the new ones around. Yeah. There I take two three D cubes, yeah. and I connect the dots around. Yeah. And so I, I connect um, for each face. Yeah. Each pair of faces. Yeah. So I have six new cubes because I have six faces. Yeah. Plus the two cubes they started with. Yeah. 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 Uh, one more question for you. Ah. Right. Right. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. I repeat. <laughs> so uh, what he says is that actually we are living like in the third millennium and therefore <laughs> there shouldn't be a two-dimensional board but you should be seeing here a three-dimensional hologram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's... There will be much more about the test later. No, so, uh, yeah. it was about the pattern of uh, 2, 4, 6, 8 yeah. and uh, in zero dimensions it would be zero but isn't that kind of awkward? Uh, it's kind of awkward, but we don't fear special cases. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look at another four-dimensional shape, which is the analogon of the triangle. 
So here you see the two-dimensional triangle. You can extend the two-dimensional triangle to a three-dimensional tetrahedron by adding a further vertex and then connecting all the other vertices to that. Why is it called tetrahedron? Why is it called tetrahedron? Because it has tetra four, four two-dimensional bounding faces. Here, there, at the end, that <coughs> from below. Okay. And now we can do it again. So we add a fifth point here, and we connect all the lines. And this will be called a pentachoron. Pentachoron, because it consists of five bounding three-dimensional tetrahedra. This is built uh, by uh, five cells. And these cells are each regular tetrahedron. And can we see them in the picture? What is it? Um, well, with the cube, you just kind of duplicated the cube when going to the first dimen yeah. fourth dimension. Yeah. And here, you just added another yeah. vertex. I mean, it's not duplication, is it? Yeah, right. Uh, but this is because like, the anomaly going from two dimensions to three dimensions was different with the square and the triangle. If you want to pass from a square to a cube, then you have to copy the square and then connect all the lines. If you want to pass from a triangle to a tetrahedron, you just have to add one single more point. And whatever the process is from going from 2D to 3D, we do the exact same thing when going from 3D to 4D. That's okay, but here's a question. Do you see the five tetrahedra of this four-dimensional pentachoron? Yes. Go ahead. Tell us. Well, they are going from one of the four sides to the point. Right? So for each of the four intuitive sides, we have the tetrahedron going to the center point here. So we have seen four tetrahedra. If there's one without the point there. The fifth is the already existing The fifth is the already existing tetrahedra, which you see here. And it doesn't go to the point. It doesn't go to the point, right. But it's okay because in the usual three dimensional tetrahedra, consider this front face, it too is not connected to the back vertex here. There's always one point missing. The front face is separated from the back vertex. Isn't there from 1D to 2D, there's still one line which is... Yeah. yeah. So in 5D, you would have just another point yeah. connected to all the yeah. points, yeah. and then all the 4D sides would be all the points but one. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I cannot imagine them uh, to be regular. Yeah. So, spoiler alert, I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> then we have to use the magic mathematics to just continue and go on. <laughs> but this is related to the following question. I mean, uh, we saw five tetrahedra here, and one of them was, for example, this front triangle connected to the center dot, and another one was the, the, the outer tetrahedra. So now you can think they totally overlap. I mean, the front triangle to connect it to the center bar seems to lie inside the whole outer tetrahedron. It's like here. The front triangle here seems to overlap in the two-dimensional sketch with this triangle here. They seem to overlap in the two-dimensional sketch. But in fact, they are in three dimensions separated. Yeah? They only meet at um, this edge. And at uh, the pentachoron? Was, was the case here. I mean, where is this point then, when it's not inside the, the outer tetrahedron? Well, this is a picture of something three-dimensional. Actually, this point here isn't in, this, in, in the same three-dimensional space as the outer tetrahedron. This point here is moved a little harder. Just as this point is moved a little in the back direction. Yes? So it seems to me that the four-dimensional uh thingy is just four tetrahedrons glued, glued together at the tip. It seems like that. Yeah, it seems like that. But it isn't. It isn't. But we have a tetrahedron 
glued together in four dimensional space. You, 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 you left out the yeah. out of tetrahedron, yeah. and that's just like you would leave out here the bottom triangle, then what would you have? You would have three triangles glued together and one chip. <laughs> With one connecting the bottom. With one connecting the bottom side, which is like right. 50, 12 years. And by being connected to the other triangles and edges, and this outer tetrahedron here closes up the um, pentacorum by being connected to the other tetrahedron at these outer triangles. <coughs> okay. Let's Let's have a look at that. Okay, so what's Flatland? Well, uh, in Flatland, there are a few friends of us, and uh, these friends are triangles. Very sure they are very nice triangles. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, and Flatland is, of course, a plane, and these triangles can walk around on this plane, and they have a very nice life there. Uh, but we listened to them yesterday, and one triangle here did something very bad. What did he do again? I, I am always too shy to say it, but... So what this bad triangle did was a <coughs> uh, So he's a big proponent of open source software, like every good citizen in the But he used a product which is only MIT licensed, not a GPL license. <laughs> <laughs> well, very sad story. And for this incident, the little cute triangle there was imprisoned in a square prison. Okay? So they built a prison for it, and put them in there because the, 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 for the, before they closed it up. So now the question is, of course, uh, can, can he escape? Can he escape from this prison or is it safe? It was a rhetorical question, of course. Yeah. No matter in which direction the small triangle moves, it will always hit the wall of the prison. This <coughs> small triangle can never escape. Right. But what we three-dimensional beings could do, of course, is you could go there next to the plane, grab the little cube triangle, and lift the plane up, move to the side, lift it down, back in the land, and would be outside the, the uh, square, right? So uh, we, we thought about if we should do that, um, but uh, then we noticed that they have security cameras in, in this prison, and uh, we tried to imagine what would they see on the security cameras if it just grabbed the little triangle and put it out of the prison. I mean, these cameras are two-dimensional cameras. They can only build what's inside the prison. They can, of course, not build what's outside even the plane. So what would happen when I grab the triangle and lift it up when it's not in the plane anymore? Well, the, yeah, it simply instantly disappears and then would reappear outside the prison. Okay, uh, and now, um, we have something very special for you. We have uh, a demonstration here that has never done, uh, been done before in the whole world. Because Ingo actually has another friend who is a four-dimensional alien. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as you can see, Ingo is currently captured in a cube prison. There's uh, a wall here and a wall there and a wall there, and of course, the floor. So he can't stay in no direction. But now, the alien will grab Ingo and move him a little Anna so as he's not any longer in our three-dimensional space, then put him outside the prison and put him back into our space again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> very dangerous, but I'm loving the risk. <laughs> Let's hope there's oxygen where he goes. <laughs> There's what one is? little problem with this performance, yeah. namely this very good friend of mine, Matsuro. <laughs> he said he will only perform the trick if you don't look. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but there's no problem, okay? I ask you, all of you, to close your eyes now, and the alien will grab Ingo and move him a little other, and then you can open your eyes again, okay? But here's, don't forget to... Yeah, right, I close my eyes too, of course I do. Okay, so... On the count of three. One, two, three. Close your eyes. Now the alien is grabbing Ingo and moving with Anna. Okay, I think it's done. Let's open our eyes again. No Ingo anymore. It just disappeared. And as you can all see, I can. There's no problem for me.
need to move in the space where England was before, right? The space is just <laughs> empty now. What about the wall? They all existed for England. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's close our eyes again because we need Ingo, yeah? He must be put back into our, our three dimensional space. Okay, so one, two, three, close your eyes. Okay? Unless you take it. Alien, please put Ingo back out of the prison. Okay, let's open our eyes again. And there he is. Very good. <laughs> as well. <laughs> so recording three dimensions, it's no problem to tie a string, a rope, so that it cannot be unlocked. Yeah? And really there is one method to prohibit uh, that it unlocks itself completely because you can first tie a knot and then connect the ends yeah. to each other. Mm -hmm. And then the knot is just, yeah, you can't untie it anymore. For yeah. example, this knot. This is the trap for a knot, the clay black totem. And you see, no matter how you pull at the ropes, you will never be able to untie it. But in four dimensions, it's actually extremely easy to unknot this knot. Have a look at one of these intersections, or, or like knot intersections, but like straight passing like this. If you want to unknot this knot, then you have to somehow, like here, the, the ropes, and you have to somehow, like do this, yeah? But you cannot do this in three dimensions because the ropes cannot pass through each other. But in four dimensions, it's no problem. Like we have this string, we move it so closely, okay, then it will stop for a second. And now move it a little bit in the other direction. This is like in science fiction series when people get out of case. Yeah? Okay, so this I've now moved it a little bit in the other direction. And then I can simply pass through the other rope because it's not there. We have we have went a little bit in the W direction, like <coughs> one meter to the, uh, in the, the W direction, and this was at W equals to zero, and this is at W equals to one. So it's no problem to pass through this, yeah? Because they don't meet. They just look like they meet. It's just a three-dimensional projection of four dimensional things happening right now. And then we'll move it to Carter a little bit, so that it's again in the correct space of existence, and thereby we have passed the strings together. And in this way, we can untie any knot. So there are a couple of questions there first. Yeah, it's a string. It's still attached to itself, isn't it? So if yeah. I move one meter in the x direction, the rest of me goes with it because I'm attached to me. Yeah. And if I'm a string and I'm attached to myself and I move one meter in the other direction, yeah. isn't the rest of the string going to go with it? <coughs> no, it's exactly the same as regular strings. I mean, I, I can uh, pull a little bit of the string here and the rest of it which is like here, will not be affected by this in any way. <coughs> you only try to pull it a little bit at one region space. Okay, it doesn't look like there's very much slack in that string, is what I'm saying. The string that you just... <laughs> <laughs> okay. You need a little bit of extra slack. Yeah, you need a little bit of slack. And uh, there. Can you do that again, but one dimension lower? So is there something that... Un un Ungottable in 2D, but is mm -hmm. open level in 3? Um, I think we first uh, answer more questions about this knot problem, and then we're coming back to this, because that's yeah. quite uh, exactly our next topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there some kind of proof that we cannot tie a knot in four dimensions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in, in four dimensions, right? Yeah. yeah. Which, uh, which I just demonstrated. Yeah, you mean it's a, a formal mathematical proof of this? Like not using fingers? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. You, you can, can be show this. In four dimensions, or something that we uh, that involves also in four dimensions while we find it. Ah, you, you want to not other things. 
as strings because you just think that strings won't work as fast. <coughs> what I mentioned. I would appreciate that if it works in any case. I mean, what I mean is each time you would like to pull two strings to each other in order to untie the knot, you can do it in four dimensions. Mm -hmm. Maybe the problem is this is a knot in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are other knots in four dimensions. Is that the question? So there may be more complicated knots in four dimensions than in three dimensions, mm -hmm. and maybe they uh, can't be untied there. Mm -hmm. But the uh, thing is, um, this, this picture of, of two strings, uh, two strings that I want to move through each other, this is happening in three dimensions, right? <coughs> but um, if I am in four dimensions, uh, yeah. So the intuition is, the only problem you can have is that you have two strings close to each other, and you want to have one of them on the other side. Because if you can always do that, then you can just, yeah, inflate your whole string so that it, it just moves out. Okay. Well, you can can knot two points together in our three-dimensional space. So a string is like only a line. And going one down, you can't knot two points. Yeah. This would have to be more the part, but if I can see the strings on one, I need to know the shape. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. It will be like the next or the slide after that. Yeah. <laughs> So I take my third string and travel in a kappa order. Ah, uh, you mean exactly like this? But it's not not in the z direction. You are into the board, but in the other direction. Then it will be even easier to untie the knot because now you can untie it in that z direction. No, uh, I can hold for the z direction. Okay, but you can always like tilt your head so that you look on it so that it looks like this, and then you can move the trick like down straight. If you want to block the, the W direction, so you can move in that direction, how do you do that? You, you need, maybe you need a lot of string that you pass around there in a, a kind of a plane or something. But uh, is it blocking? I mean, if I have a string and I want to move through that barrier, I only have to move uh, through some intersections and I can always do that with a trick. Or what's there? Is there another possibility? Okay. Yeah, no, uh, okay. <coughs> well, uh, quick question. Could I, uh, like, this is a wrong, uh, uh, wrong dimensional object, yeah. like, can tie it in 3D, and I then tie it in two dimensional objects? Okay, we're okay. getting that. Okay, let's do it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, first, one dimension down, etc. Um, okay, so we have a one dimensional object here. Ah, or maybe, uh, before I should say, um, this is not this is one string that's tied to itself. But what about two strings, two circular strings? And my question is now, can I link them? And of course I can. Here's one string, here's the other. And I link the two and I can't separate them in three dimensions. And with the same explanation, I can, of course, separate them in four dimensions <coughs> because I move one of them up and then move it back a couple. Okay. So let's talk about, let's always talk about uh, two objects now that we want to link together and we ask, can we separate them? Can we put them far away from each other? And uh, yeah, when, when we see that we can't uh, separate two strings in three dimensions, what uh, would be the <coughs> objects we can separate in two dimensions? So if you have a plane, and maybe we have one string here, can we link this to well, it starts as a low dimension with a point. Can I link in plane a circular <coughs> string, so a circular line on the plane, with a point? Yes, I can. I put the point in there, and it's exactly the situation of the, the prism triangle. It can't, it can't move out <coughs> of this line. Yeah? You can stretch the line maybe, but it can't get away from this line. So a zero dimensional <coughs> and a one dimensional object can be linked together in two-dimensional space. <coughs> and a one-dimensional and a one-dimensional object can be, uh, can be linked together in three-dimensional space. Uh, what should we try to link together in four-dimensional space? What about one-dimensional and two-dimensional? Okay, what two-dimensional object do we want to use? Well, maybe the surface of a ball. The surface of a ball is, is called sphere, two-sphere. Uh, so uh, there's nothing inside. It's only the surface, and I want to link this 
in four dimensional space uh, to a point. Let's try this first. Okay, so, well, let's try to put the point in there. <coughs> and in there is the point. But can we get it up? Okay, right. Just move to the right. And before we have in the water, we move Anna, the constraint. Then we can just pass the water. Then we move Kata, and then we're outside. Okay, it seems like you can't link a two dimensional to a zero dimensional object in four dimensions. So let's try a two dimensional and a one dimensional object, the sphere, and a line, a string. Okay, how do we do this? I, I kind of want to take the sphere and just let the line go through there. So it's inside for some time and outside the other time. Okay? But just now, like when you do it like this. Yeah, yeah. right. Then it's going from the top and leaving at the bottom and joint. Yeah, but but uh, I, I can't I can't do this in three dimensions what I want to do, right? Because the string when it goes in here, it can't intersect the, the, the sphere. That wouldn't be allowed. I want to link it without intersecting each other. So the string goes here and then it goes a little other. And it goes here and then it goes cutter again. Now it's in the same three dimensional space as the previous. <coughs> and now I go cutter instead of Anna to get out again and back Anna to the beginning. So when it, get, when it goes in, it's in the Anna direction. When it goes out of the sphere, it's in the cutter direction. And actually, you can't separate these two anymore. Now. It's a two dimensional and a one dimensional object linked together in four dimensional space. Because what happens when I when I start to pull at the string? I think it, it would be nice to see first how this situation looks like for our three-dimensional eyes. So we have the starting part of the string here, and here we have the sort of ball. And the suggestion was to start going left, but also immediately start going under, which I can't perform. Yeah. Now we are quite a bit under, quite a bit under of the sphere, like on top of the sphere, under of the sphere. And then we go cutter, 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 cutter until we leave the until we are below our space resistance, and then we go right and Anna again, so we're that we're here. And how does it look like for our three-dimensional eyes? For our three-dimensional eyes, the string now looks like two points, because the string is only in our space resistance at the very beginning, and when it passes through the, uh, through the sphere, uh, through, the, through the wall, through the center. This, this point is at the center of and now if we try to untangle it, like separate this with those two bodies, then we can try to move it in this direction, or in this direction, or in, uh, in this one, I that. Yeah. Yeah. And you can also move it on or cut up. Or we can move it on and cut up, and we'll always hit a wall. Because there will always, no matter how we move the string, there will always be at least one point inside the sphere that's in our three dimensional space. There are only these two points at the beginning, and now we can do crazy stuff with strings so that there are 10,000 points in the sphere that are in our three dimensional space, but it's, it's, it doesn't help you because there's always at least one point in here. It, because, uh, yeah, and at this point it can't move through the surface because this surface is also in three dimensional space and that would be an intersection. We were very, very happy when we discovered how to link a string with the surface of a two dimensional board. So, we want you to be happy as well, so please ask questions to us in order to ensure that you understand, understood how to not, how to tie together the string and the surface of the board. Afterwards, we will continue in our faster passion, but this we want to uh, make right. So, that's the question. How would it look like if I turn the string so it's completely in our three dimensional? Yeah. So the sphere is in the. Ah. ah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the string, can you now the, the circular string. Um, okay, and, and the circular string, as we said, it's not in the three dimensional space, mm -hmm. only two points, but now we can rotate it somehow so that uh, it is in the three dimensional space, and now the sphere is not in the three dimensional space. <coughs> the sphere intersects the three dimensional space, the, the new space we're looking at, where all of the string is lying, but not the whole sphere is in there. And what does the intersection look like? It's this string, and from the sphere, we only see also a line, a line that goes so. So this exactly looks like the two uh, linked circles in, in three dimensions. Yeah? Um, couldn't we also link two 3D spheres like this? Because you floated one into the 
then we will also, we'll also look back if we have a sphere, <coughs>
but let's escalate even further. Not that there are five dimensional aliens, or six dimensional aliens, or seven dimensional aliens. We have uh, given you the formulas here, and by looking at the numbers, you see that the ratio of the volume, of the n dimensional volume of the n dimensional ball sitting inside the n dimensional cube gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and in fact, it will tend to zero as the number of dimensions goes to infinity. So, in high dimensions, spheres are very small. They are extremely hard to reach by chance when you uh, throw arrows at it. I think this is quite a peculiar fact. And I think I don't, we don't have time to ask about it, because we want to show you quite a few nice pictures. Okay, uh, let's have a look. <laughs> and kissing hyperspheres. Okay, this is a picture of kissing surface, not hyperspheres. What are these circuits? Well, you see the vortex uh, dotted surface there, and they are kissing, that means they're touching all forms. And the arrangement uh, is arbitrary, but we have uh, first taken a square, and I think it's now a square of side length 2. Yeah. Exactly, because then if we arrange uh, the circles like this, they are unit circles, circles of radius 1. Okay, and then of course we can draw another circle in the middle, a little circle that uh, tries to fill the space there around the origin, and we can take the radius of that. And uh, yeah, you can do it um, um, as follows. The distance from the center point to one of the vertices of the square is root 2, and then we have to subtract uh, the radius of one of the big circles, and that's 1. So root 2 minus 1, that's 0.4 something. Okay, it's a little circle. We can also do that in three dimensions. Let's take a cube, let's take its vertices, and let's put uh, balls at these vertices, and I mean the center of, of, of eight balls at these eight vertices, so that they are kissing, and then they have radius one again. And what about uh, if you put a little ball in the middle that tries to fill the space and kisses all the others? It's root three minus one now. And the interesting thing is, it's gotten a little bigger. Okay, the small ball is now a little bigger compared to the big balls. And what about dimension four? You can take a tesseract, take hyperboles at its 16 vertices, and so on and so on. Put a little ball in the middle, and the little ball has now radius root four minus one. Root four is two minus one. That's one. So the little ball in the middle has now radius one, exactly as the outer balls. So it's the same size now. Okay, so this is a nice arrangement of uh, 17 balls in four dimensions. So if you use the four dimensions, remember to take 17 half balls and arrange them like this, because one's in the middle and the others are kissing around it. Okay, and what about five dimensions? Well, for dimension n, it's root n minus 1. And the great thing is, root n gets out really big as n grows. So in high dimensions, this inner ball isn't uh, just as big as the outer balls, but it's much bigger. It's much bigger than any of the outer balls, and it's much bigger than the square or cube or hypercube. So it goes even outside this cube. And why does it do that? Well, in three <coughs> because we have only put uh, these balls at the vertices of the cube, but they are kind of very small in high dimensions. So the inner ball has very much space, and it's very big. Okay. We'll now have a look at the last two topics, which we'll do like very quickly. Maybe we want to show you a video and then tell you how to glue a tesseract. Yeah, how to construct a tesseract. So, very, very quickly, we want to think about what happens if a four-dimensional ball would pass through our space of existence. To think about it, we have this analogy with flat land. The, the, the same situation would be that the three-dimensional ball would pass to two-dimensional flatland. Let's put yourself into the eyes of this triangle. What will it see? It will first see nothing. Then the, a point will appear out of nowhere. This point will get bigger and bigger. It will be, uh, grow to a circle. Then the circle will shrink again. It will be a point, and then it will have vanished. So if a four-dimensional powerful alien being would 
uh, put a four dimensional ball throughout our space existence, we will first see a point appearing out of nowhere. This point would grow bigger and bigger to a, to a three dimensional ball. It would be quite massive at this point. And then it would shrink again, shrink again. It would be a smaller ball, it would be a single point, and it would vanish. Okay, what about the tesseract? What if the four dimensional alien takes the tesseract and uh, puts that through our three dimensional space? Okay, um, well, if, 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 um, if you have a plane and you take a cube and put it through there, what's the intersection of the plane with the cube? If I hold it nicely like this, then the intersection is just a square, right? But, uh, yeah, and, and when, I, when, I, uh, when I let it go through it slowly, then the square still appears out of nowhere suddenly. There's suddenly a square on the plane, and then it disappears. Okay, one dimension higher, the alien puts the test rate. Space. Uh, what about turning the cube while passing yeah. the plane? Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, okay. So uh, when, when, when I turn the cube and uh, put it a little into a plane, then what, what, what shape has this intersection? It's a triangle. Okay, when, when, uh, if I had turned it on an edge and would put it um, into the, the plane, it would be a, a small, um, not square, but um, just just so yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's do this now. Um, please expect that the video will be a little bit sluggish. The reasons for this are the following: so the Dina needs a VGA, but his laptop only has HDMI. <laughs> so we didn't have a converter, but we had a spare laptop. <laughs> and we are using Ethernet to transfer via the image from there to here. Okay, this is a test right for dissecting 3D space. And wow. actually a projection of that and the wall. So that one face was facing down now. We could only we could also do it so that one edge would mm. face down. And then we could also turn it so that one vertex would face down. I mean, what would face under? Right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is an edge drawing, obviously. And there's something like that. Here? If you are not satisfied with this bit of animation, just try to imagine it yourself in your head. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a good point to stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Let's get outside. Let's sit down.